and stay out. Whoa! Hey, where's my... Space Nazi piece of sh- The terms of your release include you evacuating Cardassian Empire space as quickly as possible. I will distantly escort you to our borders to ensure your cooperation and that no more further crimes are committed. They started it. Be on your way. But please, enjoy these souvenir photos of your time at the greatest empire in the galaxy. What dreams are made of? Tell that David Warner sounding asshole that there were four lights. I only said five because that out of touch moron said I could go if I did. Alright, let's just get the fuck out of here before we get arrested again. I'll just set the computer and watch the next episode, which I present to no one. Haven. We start with the captain dropping his log. They're heading to a class M beta Cassius planet, or something, called Haven. What a comforting, sanctuarious name. I bet nothing bad ever happens there. Picard says it's renowned for its beauty and rumored to be able to heal spiritually and emotionally. He also says they'll relax there briefly. So really, they're just here and have no reason to be, writing-wise. Data also brings Picard back down to Enterprise when he reminds the captain that the legends of Haven have not been backed by science. But Picard offers that legends like that are the spice of the universe. Then they stare in silence for five real-time seconds. We then find Riker, chilling in his room, watching a hollow projection of two women in shiny sheets playing harps. Riker has some weird jollies to get off. This scene is slightly creepy and really reminds me of the Star Wars holiday special, just less Wookiee grunting. Riker is called to transporter room one, and he's so annoyed that he rolls his eyes. How dare you interrupt me enjoying these women staring at me carnally. He even apologizes to the ladies before turning them off. You know, this guy might be a bit of a horn dog. No wonder Troy couldn't lock that down. Riker arrives in the transporter room and asks Yar what's up. Apparently, even though this is an instantaneous act, there's something being beamed from Haven to them, and with ample warning apparently. In fact, they're only now asking for permission to beam it over. It's all very convenient. They beam over an abomination, resembling an aluminum beer cooler with some kind of Wonka-esque face. Troy comes in for some reason, and the cooler face comes to life, saying he holds a message for Deanna Troy. How convenient, she just came in, ah, screw it. This face looks and sounds like that one Ferengi guy. Probably just my imagination. But it tells Troy that someone named Loxana Troy and the Miller family will soon arrive. A momentous day is close at hand. The face screams, rejoice! then cackles and dies. Troy backs away like a scared kid, on the verge of tears, repeating the word, no, over and over. A panel opens under the face, revealing it wasn't a beer cooler. It was a gift box of jewels, a wedding present. When Riker asks who's getting married, Troy weakly says, me. And on that stinger, the banging titles start. When we come back, Troy is telling Picard she thought her duty and distance had separated her from this archaic beta tradition of arranged marriage, but it appears to have caught up with her. On top of that, she'll have to resign her post to get her ass in the kitchen, I mean to be with her husband. Riker doesn't take the news well, but it's not like he was banging her. He'd rather watch hollow Paris Hilton knockoffs play the space harp. She says, Bill, you want more than anything to be a captain. That's not all I want. I know that. I can feel it. She tries to comfort him, but he doesn't like the taste of any of this. God damn it, girl, I had you on the back burner. I was coming back. Is Riker a teenager? She asks him to come dance at her wedding. And I may not like this girl so far in the series, but this is very graceful of her, and she's showing some great emotional strength and maturity. It even rubs on Riker as he almost smiles and says, I'll try. The orchestra weeps and Riker leaves. As he does, Data enters, telling Troy the Miller party is requesting to beam aboard. Troy just nods her head, as if shaking back tears, and walks off, leaving Data confused. In the transporter bay, Troy greets the arriving Millers, who seem normal. The mom looks stiff, the dad is obsessed with the vehicle, and the son seems reserved in the back. He's the only one not talking, not moving. He finally walks up and introduces himself to Troy as Wyatt. He gives her a chameleon rose. It's a mood ring, if mood rings worked as advertised and were flowers. 
Being the rose is supposed to reflect the holder's mood. It's curious that when she grabs it, it cycles through all the colors until solidifying white. White being all colors and black being none. I'm getting that she's feeling almost every way she can about this at this point, her dilemma becoming instantly more conflicted. Wyatt says Troy's mom is still down on planet. Troy asks why. So Wyatt asks for the captain to dismiss his parents. I mean, show them their quarters. And even Picard smiles at the Wyatt maneuver. The dad is dense and wants to stay or take a tour. And the mom spells it out for him and the audience. That Troy's mom is either a snooty uppity bitch, holds petty grudges, or both, and won't beam over while the Millers are still around showing their faces. Either way, I'm already afraid of how annoying this woman is going to be. The Millers leave, and Troy tells Picard she's surprised by Wyatt and the exchange, and she feels similar odd feelings from him. They then ready themselves for Troy's mom, who beams over after a warning of her eccentricity from her daughter. She also beams over with Lurch as a manservant. And of course he doesn't talk, because this guy is literally Lurch. Walks on a Troy, beams in, staring at the back wall, for an offhand bit that kind of makes you wonder how they always beam facing forward. When Deanna Troy greets her, Waxana telepathically says, Use your mind, not your mouth. But Troy defiantly continues to verbally communicate. Why is this rose still white? Why not pink for shame or red for irritability? Waxana greets the captain, boasting that they'd of course send the captain to greet her. Nothing less was expected. She's loud, and not just her outfit. She's bold, commanding, and quite full of herself, while still being completely oblivious of how annoying this makes her. Definitely a rich white woman. She literally treats Picard like a bellhop while emasculating his stamina. She also will not shut up, bragging about how everyone wants to sleep with her and they are beneath her for it. She asks questions that she interrupts the answers to. Then she calls the Miller woman a chatterbox. She's just great. I should honestly hate this character, but the performance saves it and makes it work as intended. She's so pompous and she seems slightly aware of her superiority complex, but just sees it as true superiority, stemming from her ability to read others' minds. Even though logically, this would mean she would have a far more humble demeanor than presented, even if this behavior is just a shield from the incessant negative opinions of others that she can't pluck out. She's very pleased with herself when she gets a rise out of her daughter, causing Troy to do as told and speak mentally. In the guest quarters, they continue arguing about culture shock, when Waxana apologizes for all of this. The Millers tracked her down to remind her of the vows, so here they are. Troy expresses her disapproval of the arrangement, but promises to honor the agreement. Mother comforts daughter, and the rose turns purple, then dark blue, finally. On the bridge, a call comes in from Haven. A woman named Valida Enos appears on screen. She says she's the first elector, so I'm guessing president? She looks like Meg Foster in the laziest Cindy Lauper costume ever. She tells the captain a vessel has crossed their borders without clearance and isn't communicating. She asks him to protect her if necessary, citing their treaty. Meanwhile, Wyatt is staring at the ceiling paneling of his quarters when Troy comes in to apologize for her mother's behavior, even though he was gone when she got there. He's very polite, even diplomatic with his answers to her. He almost seems shy or nervous about something. He says he's a medical doctor. Guards drop, and she admits she probably could read his thoughts, like a full beta eventually. She goes to say she only felt as strong of a bond once before, but stops herself before finishing with someone on this ship. Wyatt asks if he has competition, and she says no. He just wants to captain a ship. Wyatt says he just wants to cure people. Troy says she's a shrink, and they could work in concert since they'll be together. And he seems sad, saying... That is the point of marriage, I suppose. So let me get this straight. She can tell Picard how random aliens she's never even seen before are feeling from like half a light year away because she sees them on a screen. But she can't pick up on this guy's emotions in front of her because I can. She even points at multiple sketches of the same blonde woman and only gets out of it that he might have wanted to be an artist. Troy finally guesses that he expected her to be this woman. Wyatt confesses it's a face that's haunted him his entire life. He thought it was Troy, projecting herself into his mind the whole time. And now, his foundation is cracked. He's still a gentleman, though, saying don't mistake a childhood fantasy for disappointment. You're beautiful, and I'm honored. But it's all awkward now, for them and for me. And we all just have to go forward pretending it isn't. 
On the bridge, they are finally able to zoom in on the vessel approaching Haven. It's still a couple of hours out at its slow speed. It gives the captain pause when he sees it's what he calls a Torellian vessel. Riker is confused, as the Torellians are supposedly all dead. Picard calls the doctor to the bridge for no reason, and then says, They must not be permitted to destroy us. Thanks for that insight, Captain. I'd hope that was a gimme for any of these encounters. I spy with my little eye. A Tim Burton bike tire? Computer, what is that? Cardassian Space Station, Tarek Nor. Yeah, probably shouldn't stop there for snacks. Just, yeah! Back with the crew in the observation lounge, as Data exposits that the Torellians wiped themselves out with biological warfare. They wonder if the ship was damaged, and that's why it's traveling slower than warp. But then the doctor says they've only reached 20th century Earth-level technology. I'm pretty sure we didn't have spaceships in the 90s. Just a few shuttles and they were falling apart. Surviving Torellians escaped to other worlds just to infect them as well. So eventually the race was hunted down, even those in hiding, avoiding others. The last ship was sighted and destroyed eight years ago, giving to the complacent notion of extinction, obviously without any verification. Picard points out their conundrum. They are bound to protect Haven and the life of the Torellians, who probably just bought into the marketing of the planet when they named it Haven. Planet Sanctuary was booked. Picard then proposes an announcement of Troy's engagement, and Riker pouts off again. Later at the reception rehearsal, Mrs. Miller asks Picard to officiate, but Loxana says, Um, no. You do not know how to do it big beta style, and that will just not do all while Lurch is in the back getting pre-plastered for the show. Mrs. Miller rebutes the captain is qualified for a traditional Earth ceremony. Loxana becomes an elitist bitch and throws insults. The fight begins, and Data watches with Lurch, with the joyous face of innocent curiosity. They just need popcorn. Hold on, boys, I got you. Mama Troy says Lurch's mute ass will sign the wedding, and the matter is closed and Mrs. Miller is enraged at the balls on the Elder Troy. So the show continues to Data's delight. Picard joyfully declares, This is no time for fighting. Yeah, it's not Saturday night. Man, what a goofy grin. Later still, at dinner, Picard toasts the joining families. Lurch keeps putting them back, and Yar looks like a rooster. Lurch chugs another and starts banging on a space gong as Wyatt and the Doctor talk about the incoming plague ship. Wyatt wants to prepare med supplies to beam over to the Talarians, and the doctor agrees. The mothers then fight again about Mama Troy's intrusive practices, such as the gong during dinner, a zealous ostentation she never seemed to show back in the day. Loxana huffs that she's in growth, but I call that a widow's midlife crisis. Bro, is that another drink? One for every color of the rainbow, Lurch. Mama Troy terrorizes Mama Miller with an ivy that seems to be able to move itself like a snake. She's a bit of a bully, and Mrs. Miller seems to be mostly just calling her out on it. Riker stands to leave, but at least this time he excused himself. Data asks Mama Troy to exposit to the audience about the beta wedding traditions, and she'd be delighted to. First off, everyone's naked. That's really about it, actually. Now, I'm sure there's all sorts of pompous ritual, but that's really the main part. Mama Miller is appalled, and Mama Troy takes the opportunity to dig at the woman's body and brag about how Mr. Miller wants to have an affair with her. Jesus. You know what? No, I don't like her anymore. She's a miserable, delusional bully. And she's annoying. Even her daughter has had enough of the petty bickering, admonishing her mother, and slapping the gong down on her way out. Everyone gasps. Tasha giggles. And Data cheeses. Could you please continue the petty bickering? I find it fascinating. We catch up to Troy, catching up to Riker on the hollow deck. He's sulking in a desert and tells her he'll miss her, but this is unfair. Wyatt walks in out of nowhere and blows Riker off on accident. He's more involved in telling Troy he's proud of her outburst and that he managed a compromise for the wedding arrangements. They laugh, and he asks if she really wants to go through with it. She says yes, and he says he's lucky. Then they kiss. Orchestra swells. Anyway, about that ship, Picard can't raise them, but they're still coming. Meanwhile, Haven is freaking out and want Picard to vaporize the vessel. Picard instead activates a tractor beam and hauls the ship away, when finally a signal comes over the viewer, and Troy's jaw slacks, 
as she sees the face of the woman from Wyatt's sketches. Or at least close enough. She's blonde with cheekbones of doom. A male Talarian named Rin steps in and for a hunted species has the balls to be a Karen about the tractor beam before asking about Wyatt and speak of the devil. These eight Talarians are all that's left of the species and Rin still feels he's entitled to indignance. That's cute. They're also all carriers of the plague and begging for an island on Haven. Later on, Wyatt finds Loxana to talk to her about everything, but she's more concerned with how she'll look naked. Wyatt then gets the supplies in the med bay to beam to the Talarians. The doctor notices Wyatt's nervousness, but not his nice jacket. He's jumping ship, guys. He even sneaks one of those futuristic hypodermic spray needles, that hypo-spray thing, before ducking out. He runs to his parents to tell them to take care of each other. He tells Troy she's beautiful and kisses her again before leaving, just like that. In the transporter bay, he knocks out the transporter operator with the hypo spray and then beams himself and the supplies over to the Talarians. It is his destiny to go die horribly from violently shitting out his own bowels or whatever this new and another space disease does. Actually, aboard he finds sketches of himself on the walls of the ship as if he's some deity. They also resemble him about as much as her drawings do her. We'll say 75%. Rin tells Wyatt he always thought he was a dream. Okay, then why are the drawings of him all over the ship, you creepy bastard? Back on the Enterprise, the Millers are fuming at Picard, and I'm sorry, who let them on the bridge? Where's our chief of security? Doing her hair? Rin tells Picard to disengage the tractor beam. They have what they really came for and we'll be gone now. But for real, if my daughter dreamt of some guy every night, I'm not hauling the last of my species to go find him hoping he exists. This is stupid, but also weird. Wyatt tells his parents he's going to continue the work to cure these people, and his soulmate Ariana just totally believes he will. Until he dies in two weeks of the space plague that killed off most of your species, and is apparently so interspecies transmittable that the rest of your species was slaughtered over it. But sure, I believe in him too. True love, power of dreams, manifest destiny or so I don't know. Respects are paid all round. Troy looks sad, and the Talarians drive off to go extinct. What? They got one breeding-aged female and a human for her to breed with, if he lives. The Millers tell Troy to keep the wedding dowry, and depart sadly. For Loxana to stroll in, saying, Hate to waste a mood, maybe I should marry. I know the captain wants this, but he's too old. Woman... You older than he is. She even tries for Riker, but her daughter gets territorial. Lurch actually speaks to thank the captain for the drinks. Her mom gets a couple more of her antics off and then beams away. The crew get ready to warp away, as like Wyatt, their destiny is elsewhere. They punch and warp too and engage. Roll credits. I want to like this episode, and at first I did completely. But the longer the episode went on, the worse it got. I'll just give it a meh. Real time. Haven, originally airing on November 30th, 1987, takes a deep dive into Counselor Deanna Troy's personal life and cultural background as she faces social issues while the Enterprise encounters a mysterious ship from a supposedly extinct and highly contagious plague race. Haven provided a significant opportunity for character development, particularly for Marina Sirtis, exploring Troy's Betazoid heritage while delving into the emotional and cultural aspects of her character. Written by Tracy Torme, who was a key contributor to The Next Generation's early seasons, Torme aimed to introduce the concept of arranged marriages, adding a layer of cultural diversity to the show to challenge the crew's and the audience's perspectives on relationships. The episode features a subplot involving the Talarians threatening New Haven with their mere presence. The writers face the challenge of balancing this enigmatic storyline with Troy's personal narrative. Crafting a cohesive script that seamlessly integrated both elements was a delicate task that suffered a hard landing. This episode also showcased elaborate costume designs, especially Mama Troy's and the characters from Haven. The production team collaborated to create visually distinct and culturally representative attire, adding authenticity to the representation of different planetary societies. One notable aspect of Haven is the casting of Majel Barrett Roddenberry as Luoxana Troy, Diana's mother. Barrett Roddenberry, often referred to as the First Lady of Star Trek, had a long-standing association with the franchise, having played the first officer in the pilot episode of the original series and then Nurse Chapel in said series. 
She then voiced most computers until her death, and was of course Jean's wife. Her involvement in The Next Generation added a nostalgic touch for fans. Haven received mixed reviews from both fans and critics. While some appreciated the exploration of Deanna Choi's background and the introduction of Betazoid culture, others found the episode's execution lacking and pacing uneven. In hindsight, Haven offers a glimpse into the creative processes and challenges faced by the production team in bringing a Star Trek episode to life. Despite its mixed reception, it played a role in shaping the ongoing narrative of the series and provided opportunities for characters' development that would resonate throughout the show's seven-season run. Haven stands as a pivotal episode that contributed to the overall narrative arc of Star Trek The Next Generation. The challenges faced behind the scenes, from script writing to special effects, shaped an episode that remains a part of the series' legacy, offering viewers a glimpse into the personal and cultural facets of the characters. Ugh. What the hell? Who undressed me to change my clothes? Perverts. Matthew Sedgwick, you have found the gates to our realm, but you are not pure or kind. Pretty judgy for sex criminals. What's with all the smoke, y'all blazing? Leave the wormhole and never return. Or else what? We will destroy you. You know what? You drive a hard bargain. I'm going to fly away from here and never come back. Unless in a few years, Starfleet somehow ends up commanding that space station and this wormhole somehow. But what are the odds of that? 